Welcome to this edition uh, to The Voice of Diaspora. We're lucky enough to have a very special guest with us today, the founder and chair of one of our associations, one of our CCCA associations, Mustafa Qureshi, the um, head of the Jezira uh, Association. Welcome, Mustafa. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on. Uh, it's really it's really great to have you on today. Um, we're going to talk about um, your organisation, some of the work you've been doing, mm -hmm. and also an area that's of particular interest to me, which is the, your support for the plight of the the uh, Chinese Uyghur people that, that who've been featured very heavily in in the press and on TV in the last couple of months. Um, let's start by asking about the foundation, uh, the, the association, when you set it up, mm -hmm. um, what your aims were, what your ambitions are if you could tell us something about the background. Yeah, sure. So as a, a Turkish Cypriot who feels very passionately about our identity, particularly in the field of history and heritage, um, it was often frustrating to come across um, many Western academic works um, written primarily by, by Orientalists, uh, misrepresenting or falsifying our history in many ways. Uh, things like Sultan Selim II conquered Cyprus because of his love of, of wine, Cypriot wine, as if he didn't have enough money to purchase the wine himself. Anyway, anyway. yeah. 50,000 plus martyred, mm. and God knows how much was spent to, to capture Cyprus, all because of wine. It doesn't make sense. Or you know, that uh, the first Muslims to, to have opened Cyprus uh, were pirates or raiders. And, and this is an absolute uh, insult to our, our predecessors. Mm. Um, the fact of the matter is that when you look at the primary sources, be it in Arabic or in Ottoman Turkish, uh, we find out that it's actually quite the opposite, that these mm. are, are honoured predecessors and they deserve our utmost respect. Um, but unfortunately it seemed as though due to, maybe because we've changed from our classical script to the Latin script, or maybe because of a lack of interest to actually put the work in, uh, I found that even Turkish uh, historians today are wholeheartedly accepting the narrative mm. by these Orientalists and translating these works mm. and these sources into Turkish. Uh, and as a result, in, uh, in 2008 in London, uh, Ertan Karpazla and I, my friend, uh, we just thought, you know what, we need to actually research from these primary sources, put it out there, uh, put the Turkish Cypriot narrative out there mm. as well in the academic field. Uh, so we found it and we've had a number of Turkish Cypriots uh, join us throughout the years. Uh, initially, we was called Kupus Türk Murasına Hizmet Derne. It's quite a long name, and no one could really remember the name. Mm. So the team and I decided that we need to change the name, something short, so something that actually uh, was symbolic and was uh, in in line with our aims and objectives. And as such, we came up with the name Jezire, and Jezire in Ottoman Turkish means island. Okay. So you'd come with the sources Jezire Kupus Kupus Jezire Si. So Jezire Derne was quite was quite fitting, mm. uh, and since then we've been we've been really active, um, not only in London but we've had um, we've had our we've been we've gone abroad as well, be it Cyprus and uh, even Bosnia, Western Thrace, and such as well. Really interesting. So you talked about going back to primary sources because mm. all the secondary evidence and all the secondary sources were skewed by um, a, a perspective that really didn't fit with what you believed or thought might be the case. Mm -hmm. How did you go about um, identifying those primary sources, accessing them and enabling um, that the information held in those sources to be unlocked? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, just through, I mean, obviously at first, just by reading these things, some of the things in it sound quite right. Um, and eventually through reading other secondary sources, start picking up information. But then I was quite fortunate enough uh, to have the opportunity to join a number of Ottoman Turkish classes. Were uh, they here in, in, in the here, UK? Yes, yes, there was a number of uh, classes at various uh, places. Unfortunately, they, they only taught up to like a beginner intermediate mm. level and after that point I had to kind of self-teach myself. Mm. But thankfully we're living in an age where that is possible. Mm. Um, and uh, as, a, as an association, what we want to do is provide a service to the community. We realise that not everyone has the same motivation or has a time to actually start learning Ottoman, going to the primary sources. So it's something I'm passionate about and I want to provide a service in which I'm able to decipher these sources and put it out there in a digestible format for our community and for others to, to, to look into as well. I've just brought some sources as well, as you can see. This is, this is Turkish. Yeah. yeah. This is an older one as well. So. And what are these documents? Okay, so this is 
Tufat uh, al-Kibar by Chelebi. This source is talking about the opening of Cyprus from the 1600s. Um, and this is also regarding the same issue as well, um, but it's a later copy. Uh, so this is written in Ottoman, Ottoman Turkish. Ottoman Turkish. Yeah. It's from six, the 1600s. That's right. Um, so this would have been written um, after the, the Ottoman conquest, um, and it sort of describes the events yes. that, that, that led up to um, the, the, the island being taken over by the Ottomans. Absolutely. So the Cyprus was taken in 1571, so it was written soon after. And it explains things like, another misconception is that um, Lala Mustafa Pasha, he, you know, he's fed the famous example of what happened with Marco Antonio, Marco Bragadino. Yeah. Oh, he, he tortured him and he, he, he took his skin off and all these kind of uh, brutal acts, uh, which is true. And you know, if we take a nuanced approach, we can say that he may have taken, he, well, he would have taken things to an extreme, we mm. can say. And, and even Ottoman historians have said that he took things too far. However, what's lacking in the Western sources is the motivation. So they agreed as part of, um, when, when, when the Ottomans took Famagusta, part of the agreement was that they would, the, the Venetians would give back the Muslim captives. And they had agreed to that. And what Marco uh, Bragadino did was he killed all of them. Oh. And that was the motivation. Again, that's lacking. And it's only by going to the primary sources yes. where you can see that yeah. there. Um, but by, by doing this, we, when we try, as I said, I want to make it digestible for our audience. So we try to take an academic uh, approach rather than the old kind of cliched flag waving and all this kind of nationalistic rhetoric mm. that our people don't really latch on to anymore. I think we've, we've, as a community, become a lot more mature uh, in the kind of information that we want to take on board, not just like rhetoric that doesn't really mean yeah, much anymore. That, that, can, that can be quite sensationalist. Exactly. Kind of, that, that, that serves for political ends. This yes. is documenting in its in its original form yes. in a in a you know, in a language that we can digest and understand today. Mm -hmm. Those sources which wouldn't be available to us otherwise. So, are you yeah. working with uh, academic institutions, with universities? How, how is your work sort of? Um, being shared in the wider world. Of, of course, mm -hmm. this is of great interest to our community, but I imagine this will be interesting to lots of academics. You know, yes. you know, institutions like SOAS might be interested in some of the work you do. Mm -hmm. Are you working with any academic institutions at the moment? Uh, we are looking to uh, in the future. What we've had to do is over the years is we've had to start building a name for ourselves, get us, ourselves out there. So we've had a number of seminars over the years. Mm -hmm. We've attended cultural festivals. Um, I've written a number of articles as well regarding an introduction to Turkish Cypriot history, mm. even about Turks in London. Um, so we're just trying to get the, the attention of the community. A chronology and actually build a chronology and a, a repository of information Absolutely. that can but be shared. through different mediums as well. So we have an active social media account on Facebook and Instagram. On YouTube as well, we have a channel there. Um, I've interviewed a number of um, key, key, key stakeholders mm. to do with our culture and history. So, for example, in terms of academia, uh, Mustafa Hashim Altan, who is a very famous historian in Cyprus, he was the founder of the archives in, in Kirinya. I interviewed him as a three-part series in, on our YouTube channel. Uh, Mehmet Ertu, who's the last Karagözcü, Karagöz puppeteer, I've interviewed him as well, and he explains things. So we're getting these primary sources out there. Um, it just It's on YouTube, so it's easy to digest for yeah. people now. Um, so the next level now, we're looking at starting to go to more mainstream academic um, institutions. Um, so that is in the process. Hopefully, SOAS, as you mentioned, is mm. something we, we're looking to get into. Um, however, we need to, we're trying to uh, confirm someone who's actually studying there because it's by invitation, okay. in which you can go there. Um, so, but 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 ultimately, I want to focus on Turkish Cypriots first. Yeah. Those are my key market. Yeah. Secondary is everyone else for me. So how, how does the work that you're doing and all this research and everything that you've learned, how are you bringing that to the Turkish Cypriot English speaking world, obviously mm -hmm. here and also in the States, in Australia, we have a, a, you know, a huge community, the work that you're doing will be easily sort of transportable, translatable mm -hmm. and relevant to, to those groups as well. How can people access the work that you're doing? Yeah, we try to get a good mix of uh, rather the ver through the various mediums that we we promote our work is in either English or Turkish and that way we can get the Turks in Cyprus uh, but also in the, the, the global diaspora as well but in terms of our seminars it's always been in English 
And in fact, this has been, I feel that in some way we've been spearheading this movement um, because when we had our first um, seminar, it was regarding the Turkish Cypriots that supported the Turkish War of Independence. And it was in English. It was in the 100th year of the Çanakkale War. And we actually had a member of the audience from our, our more elderly members of, of the community. He said, why are you guys speaking in English? This is an absolute, you know, this, this is a disgrace. You should be speaking in Turkish. And our response to that is, I totally appreciate where you're coming from because traditionally that's how we have been promoting ourselves for the last 30, 40 years mm. living in the UK. But by doing so, we've disenfranchised a whole generation of Turkish Cypriots and members of other communities. Mm. And in fact, at that, uh, in, that uh, in the audience ourselves, we had many uh, youngsters who maybe can speak Turkish, but to a, at a basic level. We had members of the, of the audience who were Algerian. We had a Portuguese lady that came along, and there were even Irish sisters that, that came there as well. And don't forget, it's going on YouTube as well. So there's so many people who will be able to now access that information who, had it been had it been in Turkish, we would have had the same people in the same And we'd be talking circles. to ourselves, and this is a real problem because yeah. we're very good at talking to ourselves in mm -hmm. our own language and telling our own truth. And, and because of some of the injustices and misreporting of Turkish Cypriot history, especially since you know the 1950s, mm -hmm. there's been a, a, a phrase that summarises this attitude of, uh, and in Turkish it's like mm -hmm. you know, don't worry about them, we know the truth. Mm -hmm. But the work that you're doing, and especially making it accessible in English, actually unlocks that and makes that truth available to the English speaking world. And it's the, you know, like it or not, it's the language of yes. the business, it's the language of academia, mm -hmm. and it's really important that we make all of these uh, sources and all this information available in a language which brings our story to the wider world. So, I'm, you know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly supporting uh, the, the push to, to communicate in English, this, this really important work you're doing. Do you have any publications or reports mm -hmm. or academic papers that um, anyone who's watching could, can access? Uh, there is a website uh, called uh, Academia, I think academia.org. I, a, a I have a profile on there and mm -hmm. people can download some of my, my academic work from the articles I've written for newspapers and, and uh, magazines and, and, and such. There's also the videos uh, on the YouTube channel. So if you just search my name on, on, mm -hmm. on the, that website, academia.org, um, you can find it on there. However, the, the last seminar that we presented in February regarding the precursors of the Turks of Cyprus, um, that was actually, the idea came about because I'm actually working on a book regarding that subject area. Um, I'm on like page 161 now. So hopefully when that comes out, mm. then it will be something which uh, mainstream academia can actually reference to as well. And all the sources are there in the footnotes. So um, that's my main focus in, in pushing that. So I was going to ask you later, but I will ask you now since sure. you've mentioned it. Um, I actually attended one of your talks mm -hmm. on on the the precursors to the Ottoman Turks and the the, the Islamic history, if you like, of of um, Cyprus. And it mm -hmm. was a really interesting um, and really informative. I had no idea that you know you had all of these Levantine um, occupants of Cyprus, many of whom were from what are now Muslim territories, mm -hmm. uh, who were the original and some of the first occupants of the island. Could you give us a brief, I know it's, it's ambitious to try and ask you to recount a, a two hour talk in five minutes, but mm -hmm. can you give us the kind of the a top line of, of, of what you found in that research? Yeah, of course. Uh, so the, that was just a small sample. Uh, it was like a two hour mm -hmm. talk, but it was just a small sample of the information that we found. Um, it was mainly to talk about, rather than you know this narrative that we're pushing, it's always about the Cyprus conflict in modern era, 1974, or the Ottomans came in 1571, half a page, and then we go up to the Cyprus conflict. We're not doing ourselves justice. We're not doing ourselves justice. We need to look at our identity as a multi-layered. We have an ethnic background, which is Turkish, and we also have a Muslim identity. Now, being part of the Muslim civilization does not necessarily equate to being a Muslim. So a Greek Cypriot would have some level of association with a Muslim civilization because of their association with the Ottoman Empire. Mm. So often I feel that members of our community don't really uh, struggle to grasp this concept, uh, even though members of the English community understand this a lot better. They'll talk about the Muslim civilization, the arts and the heritage and such, and it's not seen as a spiritual topic. Um, so by looking at it through that lens, we can see that when... Pretty much when Islam was founded, 
and the Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him, actually had a dream and he predicted uh, the conquest of Cyprus. And this was to come true. And the first people to go to Cyprus were the companions of the Prophet. And anyone who has access or is fortunate enough to read about these individuals, they will know that they were people of high morals. They were people who went there for a reason to spread the good news. And we were fortunate enough to have these people there, not only have them there, but there many have been laid to rest there, most famous of which is Hala Sultan. And from there on, we've had uh, the armies of, what they, from the Umayyads and the Abbasids who were actually living there. And there, were, there was actually evidence um, to show that there was coins minted with the word Kubrus, Cyprus, on there. And further to that, then we start seeing what they called the, the Mamluks, who are actually the Turkish dynasty from Egypt. They weren't always like us, they were Kipchak, and they were going there and they actually took Cyprus and made it a, we could say a tributary of, of their, their country, but when they took Nicosia, they said that this is, this is the land, this is Nicosia's city. And what city time is this? What, what, what sort of, on, in terms of the, the chronology of Cyprus, what, when, we, when you talk about mm -hmm. the Egyptian Muslims taking um, Nicosia, yes. when would that have been? So it's when we focus on, we would be familiar with like the Lusignans and the, and the Venetians, the Latin era, mm. that was during that period. So although the administration may not have been in the Muslims' hands, we were a key stakeholder, we were the owners and they were governing it on behalf of the Sultan. And so when we look at this, the, the Cyprus trade, this Cyprus mm. Tepsi that we look at, even we are promoting this narrative where there's the Byzantines, the Venetians, and, and so on, and there's just a brief mention of the Turks mm. there. And we have all this rich history, which means that we are deep-rooted in Cyprus. And although ethnically we can look at the Mamluks as Turks who were there, our spiritual predecessors, who, people who belong to the Muslim civilization, if we include them as well, then in total we have a 1,400-year stake in Cyprus. Now, I'm not taking away Greek, Cypriot or any other community's stake in mm. Cyprus at all. We can share our experience of Cyprus. This isn't a conflict at all mm. in that regards. But us as a community need to focus on our own history first of all. Yeah. It's interesting because um, I don't know if you've done a genealogy test. Mm -hmm. um, and actually when you when you speak to Cypriot, Turkish Cypriots who've actually um, undertaken one of the uh, one of the many commercially available DNA tests, which are you know very cheaply available now, mm -hmm. which can give you a kind of a, a you know a, a portal back into your ethnic makeup. Yes. Um, fascinating what you find because um, I, I, mean, I, I don't know if you've done it. I've yes, done it, and, yes. I, and um, I'm sixty percent Sardinian, mm -hmm. and I'm amazed that I'm not. You know, I don't have um, Turkish roots. I'm also Iranian, mm -hmm. but it says a lot also about the history of the people, the, the, the fact that it was, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a place where cultures collide, yes. that you have the Middle Eastern, North African, the Mediterranean influences mm -hmm. that all contribute to this unique makeup. And we were talking earlier about words in the Turkish language, which, mm -hmm. which I thought might have been Greek or they, they might have been old Ottoman Turkish, but the word Piron, for example, is mm -hmm. uh, an old word that my relatives would use to, to mean fork. It's actually an Italian word, mm -hmm. which says that there's actually such a rich history, which also makes up our ethnic background, um, that is, you know, we have contributors like the Egyptians, like the Levantines, the Italians. So it's um, it, it almost seems unfair to, um, mm -hmm. to demarcate ourselves as sort of pure mainland Turkish heritage because mm -hmm. the island itself has got a very unique makeup. Yeah. Out of interest, what was your ethnic makeup? Oh, I had all sorts. There's, there's Cypriot there now, I think it was about 10 or 15 percent. There's some Iranian in there as well. I don't know how they got, yeah. they got in there, but that's quite interesting. It's, it's pretty much all over the place. Um, but I think just to, to clarify, a lot of people, I mean, it's become very trendy among the, the, the Cypriot community, but we seem to have this idea that the pure Turks are from Turkey because it, the country has named itself Turkey, right? And it's just not the reality of the situation. Turkey is not a race, right? The Turks came from Central Asia. The Turks in Central Asia, and we'll be discussing the Uyghurs, for example, look uh, physically very different from us, mm. right? So what does it mean to be it's an ethnicity? So our ancestors who, who continued that, that language and that heritage and that culture, they came and they mixed. So in Anatolia, for example, Turkey, they may have mixed with Anatolian Greeks, they may have mixed with Armenians, Kurds, Arabs, and so on. Um, and this doesn't make them any less Turkish. 
the ancestors to Turkey Cypriots, yes, the ones who came may have been more pure stock, we can say maybe Turkmen, Yuruk, mm. but they're also mixed as well. So we have a different mixture, but the Anatolians, the people from Turkey, are not purebred either. This idea that you, we have to have a certain amount, that all it means is, is a haplo group, what mm. they call from Anatolia and the Caucasus, where they share a similar haplo groups. So you could have a Pontus Greek or Kurd or Laz or Greek Christian mm. who would share the same haplo group as a Turk from Anatolia, but the Greek from Greece would have a different haplo group from a Greek from Anatolia. So that's all it means there. So when we have these various different areas, it just means different regions that have mixed together. It doesn't make us any less Turkish, and it doesn't make that It's a very broad uh, church, <laughs> for yeah, want of a better word, uh, being a Turk. And it actually encompasses yeah. many, many, many uh, ethnic origins and tribes, as you've said. And, and in the next part of our interview, we'll be talking about the Uyghurs, yes. which is a particular area of interest of mine. And maybe you can talk to us more about some of the other tribes and the history of mm -hmm. all of those Turkmen people, the Turkmen people that all contribute to our rich heritage. Mustafa, thank you very much. Mustafa, if we can carry on from where we left off, we were talking about um, ethnic Turkish communities mm -hmm. and the fact that our, our Turkish global community looks so varied. You know, we, we, you know, we are every shade of, of white and brown and we are blonde haired and blue eyed and we can even have a more oriental look. Can you tell us something about the journey of, of, the, of the Turkish people? It's a, it's a, it's a very crude and, and uh, um, sweeping categorization, mm -hmm. but um, we describe ourselves as Turks, but what does it actually mean? Yeah, so I mean the Turks started off in, in kind of modern kind of Mongolia kind of area. They had their a town which was like holy for them, Ötüken, which was there. Um, and there was old empires which they shared with other races as well, the Xiongnu. And it was because of the Xiongnu, a, a, a mixture of like Mongoloid and uh, Turkish people, in which the, the Chinese actually built the Great Wall to keep mm. them out. Um, so they were in a, such a uh, geographic location where there was different kind of races. There was Caucasoid pe people in that time, white people living in that area as well. So that's why we, and when we started traveling west, all the way up to the Balkans, all the way to Cyprus, even all the way to Algeria, where there's ethnic Turks living there mm. to this day. So you must imagine, I, I read somewhere, I can't recall what the book's name was, but the, the Turkish experience should be thought of as like a bus, for example. It starts off in one point, and you may have a number of people on that mm. bus, and then it, by the time it gets to the end, each stop, someone gets off, someone gets on. But the bus is a Turk, mm. right? And some people that got off, they may have gone on and become something else. But then you have other people that have joined that bus, and at the end of the journey, a percentage of that, of the passengers, would have been in the original stop. Mm. But you'd have a whole lot of other people who are there, who are part of that Turkish bus now. So we, we just have to think of, I mean, there's races in the world, there's like we can say the white race, black race, uh, what they call Mongoloid race, and, and so on. Turk is an ethnicity, not a race. Just English is an ethnicity, Greek is an ethnicity, it's not a race, it's not a racial classification. What makes us, our differences more unique is because we started in such an area which has a distinctive look, maybe more of a, a, a Mongoloid kind of appearance, but because of the great, the vast journey that we took and the people that we mixed with, their differences in our outward appearance become a lot more apparent. So in the English experience, for example, we know that the English are an amalgamation of Germanic people, there were the Normans that came, mm. Anglo-Saxons and so on. But because they were all kind of from the same area, it's very hard to distinguish them so much from other people mm. in the area. So having someone with Mongoloid features such as the Kyrgyz and the Kazakh, and then you have in Turkey, I mean, from the east to west to all over Izmir, you have kind of more fair skin, mm. you go to Urfa and they'll be maybe darker, but this is over generalization again. You can go to Bulgaria today and there are many Turks there. And it's quite interesting in London, for example, you see many of the Bulgarian Turks that come and some are very fair skinned and there's others who are darker than me mm. and they're all speaking Turkish to, it, to each other. And we mentioned last uh, episode about how people are taking the DNA test and whatnot. This is just haplogroups, this is racial features. But the Turkish ethnicity is 
Well, an ethnic group is having a shared culture, shared language, and being a member of that historic experience. And it could be a perceived experience. That's fine. Mm. As long as you see yourself belonging to that community. And that isn't unique just to the Turkish experience. The Greek Cypriots, for example, they are not racially from Greece, what we know of today. Well, all of these, all of these races are constructs, and we use them in today to describe ourselves because it helps us to to divide and categorize but you're absolutely right you absolutely know. so we, if we speak a little bit different from the way that people turks in turkey do we we don't give the mantle to or the, the 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 copyright of turkishness to turkey right you have azerbaijani turks they'll speak in their flavor of turkish mm. but they're not any less turkish so we just need to think of it in that in that kind of aspect there have been a lot of Uh, games that have been played on our communities mm. globally as Turks. So the Russians, for example, they worked very hard to work on the Turkistan, what they call Central Asian Turks, to divide them up. Your Kyrgyz, your Kazakh, your Uzbek, your Uyghur. But the land itself is called Turkistan. And Istan is, a, is actually a, a Persian um, prefix there. It, Turkistan means land of the Turks. So all these Kazakh and Uyghur, this is all tribes. Mm. So at some point we would call ourselves, they would say that these are Ottoman Turks who belong to the Oğuz tribe. They are Turkmen. But we call ourselves Turk now because at one point Turkey was the only independent, free Turkish country in the world. So we need to kind of push beyond that now where not everyone from Turkey is a Turk. And in, in, in once we start appreciating that, not only are we giving the rights to, to other communities in Turkey, But then we can accept other Turks who, what they say, dish took that in there. Mm. They're outside the Turks or the Turks from outside of Turkey. Then we can say, okay, these are Turks of a different variety. Well, it's interesting you say that because very recently I've come to learn that the term um, Yahudi describes obviously uh, people who are Jewish and yes. Jewish descent. But the word Musevi mm -hmm. actually describes Ottoman Jews. So Jews who fled the Spanish Inquisition. Who, who came to Turkey speaking um, um, a, a, a very, very unique language. Mm -hmm. It was a, com a, a, a mix of... Um, Ladino? Ladina, Spanish and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting now because you go to parts of Istanbul and that mm -hmm. language is alive only now in Turkey, mainly in Istanbul. And, um, you know, the, the, the very um, open and welcoming... Um, Uh, sort of attitude of the of the Ottoman administration yes. at the time allowed for the preservation of this very very unique Spanish Hebrew culture, yes. and those people still speak the language today. And it's the only place in the world where that's spoken. And I'm, I've heard it, I've mm -hmm. seen it. It's fascinating. And every time I'm in Istanbul and I hear it, I'm sort of drawn to these people who are who describe themselves as Musevi. Mm -hmm. It's a term that describes um, uh, Ottoman Jews. Mm -hmm. And no other. Um, but again, to the to the same point, it's a very um, the bus. You know, the, yes. the 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 people that jumped on the bus who now are Turkish could have very very different heritage, and that's yeah. a, a a fine example of, of how a, that has worked. That's a great example because the, the the Jews that came, the Sephardic Jews, the Ladino speakers, who came to the Ottoman lands, was due to uh, the, the the Spanish who came along. They kicked all the Jews out. They kicked all the Muslims out. They only wanted Catholic Christians in in the Iberian Peninsula. The Ottomans did not have any issue. The Jews are Ehli Kitab, people of the book. We respect them, we love them. There is this, this concept that the media is pushing out that Muslims hate Jews. There is nothing like this in our religion and nor is our history have anything to do with this. Any kind of conflict that's happening now is political and that's all it is. Uh, but yeah, we've had many um, people that have come, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Sephardic uh, Jews are, are one example of that. People with their kind of skewed idea of what Turkishness means. Oh, the Sultan's married. Uh, they had Hurrem Sultan who was from Russia and so what? Hurrem Sultan established Vaks, charitable associations. So for me she's a pious Muslim. She's the mother of Sultan Selim II who took Cyprus. So she, they, they didn't have this idea that they had to prove their Turkishness, but if we look at you know the actions speak louder than words, what they've contributed to us is a lot more. And if they're not going to be considered Turkish, then I don't know who will. Yeah, and there was a great tolerance under the Ottoman um, Ottoman period, and I think that has contributed to this mosaic yes, of uh, of looks and and ethnicities that um, 
are less apparent today, but have we been in uh, you know, in Turkey a hundred years ago, we mm-hmm. might have seen something very, very different. Yes. Um, so I wanted to to move on to the question of the Uyghurs. You've you've mentioned them mm-hmm. already, and I know that the Jazeera Association is backing and supporting and doing its utmost to promote the plight of the Uyghur people. Could you give us um, a background? You've already told us about the, the association between mm-hmm. the Turks and the Uyghurs. Could you tell us something about the Uyghur population now in China? How many are they? Um, um, how long have they been there? Um, and we've we've all seen in the press how their culture, language um, is, is being suppressed. More worryingly, I mean, now, the fact that there are all sorts of very unpleasant stories coming out about um, moves to curb the Uyghur population in China. So anything that you can share with us, that we can share with our viewers, would yep. be very helpful. So firstly, we need to understand that the, the Uyghur people are the native people of that land. They are under occupation. So you may have heard on the news that they call it Xinjiang, for example. This is an occupier's name. It means new frontier in Chinese. So even they realize it's a new frontier. It's something that they've gone and occupied. That land, East Turkestan, they say Sharki Turkestan in the, in the Uyghur dialect. As we mentioned, Turkestan means land of the Turks. And if we think, oh, it's somewhere far away from us, actually the distance from Beijing to, to East Turkestan, to Kashgar, mm. is the same distance from Kashgar to North Cyprus. Mm. That's how far away it is. You know, the people there, we think of China, they're not, there's, there's Chinese Muslims who are in the Gansu region. They speak Mandarin. They're actually just Muslims who are Chinese. They're called the Hui. The Uyghurs are not like them. The Hui, in fact, are not getting the same level of oppression as the Uyghurs are. The Uyghurs are getting it because, yes, they're Muslim, but it's compounded by the fact that they're Turkish as well. They speak Turkish. They don't, they don't, they don't eat chicken char mein. They don't eat dogs and, and pigs. They eat cow and halal meat, and they have mantu, mm. like we do. But rather than the small one that we eat, they have large mantu. They have kebab as well. You know, so there's a lot of similarities there because ultimately they're Turkish and they were very resistant to, to changing those customs. They established two independent republics in the 20th century. Um, you had the, the Turkestan, uh, Islamic, East Turkestan Islamic Republic and then after that you just had the Isla- East Turkestan Republic which was established. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head, it's like 1948 in which they, the Chinese came and occupied the area. And even up to that point, they were very resistant because there was the Russians who were trying to influence them to say that, you know, call it, you guys are Uyghur and that, but they never gave up on the idea of Turkishness. The reason I'm highlighting this isn't, isn't a, a nationalist rant, mm. but these people are being oppressed in their land because they are Turkish and they're Muslim, and we are Turkish and we are Muslim, and we resisted years of oppression because we was an obstacle to the Greeks gaining Enosis, mm. which is unification with Greece. Now China is there, they've got their Enosis, but these people are resisting that Chinese Enosis, as it were. And for years they were under a lot of oppression, you know, in, in Ramazan, many of the, the work, the, 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 the people who were, that were gov- working for the government were forced to eat in front of um, the Chinese, Chinese governors at the time. As that oppression started to increase, there was oppression on the headscarf, people wearing beards, people were forced to eat pork. But it's only recently where we're seeing this oppression has taken a totally different level now, where I'm hearing Uyghurs are saying, we wish we had it like the Palestinians have. You know, because a Palestinian can go to the mosque, the Palestinian speaks Arabic, the Palestinian will wear his, his, his national costume. This is all being oppressed in, in East Turkestan. In fact, it's got to the point now where Chinese officials are being sent to live with in the Uyghur homes. And when, obviously, the men have to go and work, there's been many reports of women being raped by these Chinese people, these, these officials. There is anything between up to 300, we confirmed 380 concentration camps. There's more being built um, where many Uyghurs are being sent there and they say that they've been uh, given vocational training or re-education. Actually, what's happening is there, there's there's a lot of torture there. There's there's evidence of uh, gang rape, not just on the women, but also on the men as well. Anyone, any Uyghur 
who is prominent in the community. So it's not just religious figures or people that are pushing a, an independent Turkistan, but we had um, we, famous singers who have gone in. Even Uyghurs that were towing the line, the sellout Uyghurs that were prominent in the promoting the, 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 the Chinese communist regime, even they've been arrested yeah. because they just want to completely end the Uyghur people, that their children are being taken away from them and taken to these schools to be brought up as Han Chinese, to speak Mandarin, to be loyal to the communist regime, to be denied of their heritage. And this is a crime against humanity. The Uyghurs have a incredible history. They, I mean, not that it would make it any better, but they actually have contributed so much to the human, uh, to human culture. They have uh, songs where they have their own makams. They have the atlas design that they have. Um, they, Mahmoud Kashgari, a great scholar um, from, from Kashgar in, in East Turkestan, he wrote a book, uh, Divan Lugat i Turk. And this was written for the Abbasids who were starting to mingle with the Turks. And this whole encyclopedia of the Turkish people. And we know much about our own ancestors, the old Turk men, thanks to the work of Mahmoud Kashgari. So the interesting thing there, and I, did, I wasn't aware of this, is you said that up until 1948, the, the Uyghur people in East Turkmenistan have largely been allowed and left to occupy their own lands. They've, they've been there for generations, for centuries. It's their homeland. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese actually built the, the, the Great Wall of China to keep the Mongoloids and, 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 the, and the Turkmen people out. What has driven this need to convert this population? I mean, do, you, do you have any idea how big the, the Uyghur population in, in China is? That's a, that's a difficult question to answer. Official Chinese estimates are around 11 million, 12 million. The Uyghurs themselves say it's around 20 million. Some estimates go as high as 30 million, although... Well, let's just reflect on that because yeah. the population, the current population of Greece is 8 million. Yeah. So we're talking about a population of Turkish people, yeah. Turkish origins, who self-define, who this isn't this isn't a, a, a new breakaway culture. No. They've been there, they've they these are their homelands, who are potentially as big as thirty million, who are being culturally oppressed by probably the most powerful and controlling regime in the world. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a frightening thought. Um and I don't know if you saw the reports on um on ITV News, they were sort of aired at sort of the beginning of September, September 2020. There was a three-part um, documentary, and um, for three nights, the ITV News opened with 10-minute segments on stories of Uyghur people who had fled and were being interviewed from mm -hmm. Istanbul. And some of the stories, the personal accounts, were horrendous, horrific. I mean, it's it's frightening to think these are the people that have broken out that can speak mm -hmm. what's actually happening and what's been I know the Australian government have got sort of satellites monitoring um, some of the lands that um, we believe that the, the Uyghur people are being persecuted in um, and there was this frightening report that, that said there are at least 380 camps either that have been built or in the process of being built that are re-education or assimilation camps for mm -hmm. uh, for this community it's a really I mean it's a, it's a terrifying thought um, my question to you, and I know that you're very active and this is a, an issue you're passionate about, is if we have anyone who um, wants to um, become more active, that wants to help, that wants to support, what can they do to get involved? Okay. Uh, my advice would be uh, you can follow um, the Uyghur uh, Solidarity Campaign, which is led by uh, an Uyghur activist, Rahima Mahmoud, um, easily found on social media. They have had regular demonstrations recently, um, obviously because of the such extreme nature of the oppression that's, that's been happening lately. There's also the UK Uyghur community as well, and you can find them on, on various uh, mediums of social media. Jazilat uh, Erne, because it doesn't quite fit in with our aims and objectives, we as individuals have been quite passionate to, to support them. We're not there to lead on it because yeah. they are doing a great job of it themselves, but they do need support. And it's been unfortunate when I, when I attend when I've attended various protests of theirs, you see communists, English communists there, mm. and various other communities that are backing them. And other than, I mean, Jezira Derne, the few members that came along, including myself, were the only Turkish Cypriots there. Interesting. And, and if you imagine, you, we mentioned like the internment camps, there's three million people in there. 
And we estimate that there's one million Turkish Cypriots globally, just to kind of think about the amount of the sheer number of people there. We shouldn't complain and say that no one is supporting the Turkish Cypriot cause when there's such an extreme thing happening at the moment, there's not going to be any Uyghurs left at this level in our lifetime. Mm. We need to get our voices heard. And if you think that, well, what difference is it going to make? Now, I've heard some, also heard some quite worrying things. Uh, the fashion brand Zara mm -hmm. um, has been accused, and I think it's been proven that they are using forced labour in these Uyghur um, camps mm -hmm. um, as part of their manufacturing process. And there was a protest in uh, Oxford Street, outside the Oxford right. Street store last week. Have we had any updates? What have Zara done? If I'm not mistaken, either Zara or one other uh, brand, I can't recall off the top of my head, have actually recalled and stopped um, importing uh, from China as a result of these campaigns. So it, it, it does work. I mean, some mm. sort of pressure there, okay, it's not going to stop it completely. But the Chinese government does actually take these kind of things seriously. They're, they're very, uh, they want to keep their image pristine mm. as well, even though they're doing all these acts. I mean, TikTok, which is an, a Chinese uh, social media platform, They've been very careful. There was, an, there was an Afghan girl, I think she was a British Afghan, and she has a channel about like beauty and makeup and such, and she put up a video about the Uyghurs and it, and it went down. And she kept trying, very and fine. it kept coming down yes. again. So what she did is that she had a makeup tutorial, and in the middle of it, she had a, a bit about the Uyghurs, and when it got caught so, on, yeah. they, they, they took it down. They took it down. But it was fortunate to right, start yeah. doing the, uh, getting very popular across other mediums, mm. but it just shows that the Chinese are very careful. They actually have teams, paid members of Chinese staff, who are going around and, and commenting on social media and trying to divert the narrative from the actual truth of what's happening there. Mustafa, there's um, another part of Cyprus's um, Islamic history that I'd like to ask you about. Some people mm. may have not heard of this person, um, but other people believe he has a bit of a cult following and that is the story behind Sheikh Nazim I and mean, I heard his name in Turkey for the first time when I told people that I was I had Turkish Cypriot heritage mm -hmm. they said oh you know we we're followers of Sheikh Nazim I knew nothing about him at the time um, I've come to learn a little bit but I'd like to know um, what what your take is on on the history and and uh, what he's brought to Cyprus's Islamic history yeah sure I mean Sheikh Nazim arguably is the most famous Turkish Cypriot globally. Perhaps the Turkish Cypriot community isn't as aware of him, but globally his presence has been felt all over the world, from South America, North America, all over the world. Um, he's Larnaka, he's from Larnaka originally. His grandfather is also very famous, his grandfather Kaitazad de Nazım Efendi, a very famous poet, and he's written books as well, and he was very regular in contributing to the newspapers of the time. He himself, Sheh, uh, literally means old man, but in this context, it means that he is the leader, uh, or he's been given ijazet. He's been given the qualification or permission to lead a a tarikat, as they say in Turkish, uh, which is we can call a, a religious order. We can say, and uh, at, we mentioned about Cyprus's Islamic history. Traditionally, the Turkish Cypriots have been a very religious community, a highly religious community, up until like the 1930s. And up until that point, they, these tariqats um, played a very critical part in Turkish Cypriot life. And so you had the Nakshibendi, you had the Mevlevi, and various other tariqats as well. But these two were the most prominent of, of, of the, these tariqats. And what the tariqat aims to do, it's not something that Muslims have to join, per se. You won't find mm. mention of the tariqat in, in like the Quran or the Hadith corpuses. It's something in which people who want to go above and beyond, so you've done your five prayers and you do all the kind of five pillars of Islam as well, but the tariqat aims to discipline, give that person self-discipline, terbiyah. So they'll give them extra zikr, so remembrance of Allah and supplications to remember they will follow a more strict uh, lifestyle where their whole life is dedicated to praying and, and serving the community as well. And, and Sheikh Nazim's uh, religious order is what they call Nakshibendi Hakkani, which is specific. The Hakkani element is specific to him. There's Nakshibendi in various countries, including in Turkey, but the one unique to Cyprus is a Nakshibendi Hakkani. It's the only religious order left in Cyprus now. So in many ways, he is continuing that culture of Tariqat in, in, in Cyprus. 
He later was based in Lefke, we had a Derga, which is like a, the religious, the camp of the religious order, we can say. Uh, his legacy, I mean, he was very close with the administration at the time. He was very close with Rauf Dengtash, Fazl Gucuk. Um, in fact, when the, briefly the Ezan uh, had been changed to tur- the Turkish language up until Adnan Menderes, uh, Sheikh Nazan took a stand against that and he would go around to the various villages and recite the Ezan in Arabic as well. So he's, he's quite, we can say, he's activist, he's quite a, a dominant figure in that regards. But we can say he's, he's most... His legacy, if we can say, is that there have been many people that have converted to Islam at, at, through his hand. Um, and if you go to Lefke to this day, where his son now has taken over as the Sheikh, Sheikh Mehmed Defendi, to this day you can see Germans and Malaysians and various people from all over the world dressing up with shalwar and turbans and brightly coloured costumes. And this is, this is a testament to, to his character and the way he presented Islam, which was in a way that is uh, certain segments maybe more of the kind of the hippie kind of communities were able to appreciate uh, another if we look at it from a purely trnc or turkish cypriot promotion mm. perspective i think this is one thing where our tourism board or us as as ngos or people who are lobbying often neglect and again we, we shouldn't look at things through a purely spiritual lens if we look at it from what is going to promote our cause as well, mm. this man is getting people from all around the world to come to a village in northern Cyprus. So he's really done a lot of work to promote North Cyprus as a result of his his propagation of it, of his version of, of Islam. So how many people, sort of pre-COVID, do you think, or would you guess, were visiting Cyprus every year um, to pay pilgrimage to the Delga in Lefka? Um, I wouldn't know the figures, to be honest mm. with you. I mean, I, I wouldn't say they go for homage. They, they go for to gain that terbiyeh, mm. to gain a spiritual uplifting. And that's happening on, on, on our doorstep. So that's just uh, and amazing. When did, he, when did he pass away? He passed away through natural reasons. He was a very old man um, when and he passed away. how long ago was that? I can't remember the exact date now, but it was, it's not too long ago, maybe about five years ago or so. And now his, his son is, has taken over. And there's a global following still of of this tariqat, which is based in Lefke. Amazing. I think uh, if anyone wants to find out more about um, uh, Sheikh Nazim and, and uh, his particular take on uh, Islam, they can probably look it up online and, and find out some more information. Presumably it's available in English as well. Yes, there's, there's many works in English and which have been translated. For those who are in London, um, in Tottenham you have the St Anne's, what was previously a church. Yes. Turkish Cypriots came along and turned the church into a mosque. So it just goes to show when we put our minds to something, be it religion or whatever mm. it may be, we can achieve great things. And is there a mosque in London um, dedicated to, um, to to Sheikh Nazim and, and his followers? Yes, so the one I mentioned in on, in St Anne's Road mm. uh, is dedicated to, to Sheikh Nazim and the imams follow his understanding of Islam right. and they were what they called murids of, of Sheikh Nazim. There's also one in South London as well. Uh, but just to, to clarify, I mean, Jazeera Devne is not uh, associated with this tariqat and, and none of the members, including myself, we're not, we haven't given uh, allegiance to, to this order. But it's very interesting and I would advise Turkish Cypriots that we should look into it because it's, it's contributed so much to, to raising the awareness of our people. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's obviously a name that I've heard. Never um, in Cyprus and never by a Turkish Cypriot. I know I've no. only ever heard him referenced in Turkey, but that's been enormously um, helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, your, the information you've given us on Uyghur, I think, has been very helpful to our community. Um, it would be really helpful if you are aware of any um, protests, of any campaigns, of any um, anything that we can become involved in, please share them with the CTCA and we'll mm-hmm. happily host them um, on our Facebook page, on our groups and um, um, on our homepage as well. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Thanks for having me. For everyone watching us, thank you very much for taking the time to join this programme of the Voice of Diaspora. Hoping to see you again next time.